Thank you very much, Alan. Thanks for this uh, very nice introduction. It's my great pleasure to be here. Uh, CIFAR has been uh, like a home for me for, uh, uh, for now, oh my god, 18 years. And uh, uh, according to my wife, it's been too much like a home. I spend too much time with CIFAR. <laughs> uh, but this is also a special event because uh, you know, it's uh, it's the David Dodge lecture, and uh, uh, I think uh, I'm very very honored to have been asked to deliver uh, this lecture, and uh, and I think uh, given David Dodge's many contributions to uh, intellectual and policy world in Canada, I think the topics of uh, today's lecture are probably important to emphasize and re-emphasize, especially in the context of many discussions and anxieties that exist in the pub in public's mind. So without further ado, let me jump into uh, the, today's lecture. So there have been huge changes in the labor market of the United States, Canada, and many other uh, advanced nations over the last three decades. And uh, this has, of course, come at the heels of major technological uh, transformations in the way that we live our lives, we produce, we consume, we interact with each other, and uh, especially with the uh, increased importance of robotics and AI in many workplaces, people have started asking questions whether this really uh, spells the end of work as we know it, whether machines are going to make humans redundant or much more limited in the functions that they perform, whether the type of work that we are used to, which is meaningful and a source of sort of good living and wage growth over time has come to an end. And I will show you some data in a second to sort of underscore that some of these concerns have some uh, connection to the trends that we are observing. And these are centrally important questions because unless we think correctly based on scientific and historical knowledge about how technology is going to impact work, we are going to be hampered both because anxiety is going to take the place of reasoned uh, action and because our approach to policy or other sorts of uh, corrective actions is going to be delayed or totally misplaced. So it is important to have a continued conversation on this, which will include, of course, people who are at the forefront of the AI, robotics technology, computer technology, as well as social scientists from different parts of the academic uh, divide. But it is also important to uh, emphasize that we have been here before. The anxiety about technology that we are experiencing right now is not an entirely new phenomenon. One of the giants of the economics profession, John Maynard Keynes, wrote a very, well, delivered a very interesting address in 1929, which he wrote up in 1930, uh, an essay about the world that we are going to live to our grandchildren. And in, in that essay, he got many things right. In particular, he was very, uh, very much on target in pro, uh, predicting steady about 2% a year productivity growth, increasing prosperity and technological improvements. But on one point, people have always thought that he was wrong. In the same essay, he also predicted that we would be uh, experiencing increasing technological unemployment because machines would be replacing workers as our productivity increases, he thought, there wouldn't be enough jobs for people to go around. We always taught to our students that you know, even Keynes could get things wrong, and there are strong reasons for thinking that that's not true, but now the same fears have come back again, perhaps with some justification, we'll see. Uh, another important economist, another uh, a Nobel Prize winner, Vasily Leontiev, uh, about 30 years after that, started writing about concerns about machines replacing uh, people, and uh, later on, not in 52, but a little bit later, he also came up with a very evocative image that uh, we might be just like horses. You know, in the 19th century, it was impossible to imagine the world without horses because we depended on them for everything. The world would come to an end without horses. 
and uh, then uh, huge technological advances, internal combustion engine, trams, trains, and, uh, uh, and, and better ships came along, and transport totally shifted away from animate power, and horses became, you know, uh, essentially unseen in cities and, uh, and just a hobby uh, sort of activity. Well, he said, could we go the same way of the horses? So in order to see whether those concerns that have been around with us are more apt today, we need to delve into this issue. So this is what I'm going to do, and I'm going to talk a little bit about a conceptual framework about what technologies do in, in relation to their uh, interactions with humans. And in that context, I'm going to draw a key distinction. It's an abstract distinction, but a useful nonetheless, between what I'm going to call enabling technologies and replacing technologies. And I will put computers, AI, and robotics within that framework. Once I have given you a little bit uh, of this framework's uh, uh, moving pieces, then I will move on to show uh, uh, various pieces of data about what's been happening in the U.S. labor market. What's going on to productivity, what's going on to employment, to labor share, to wages, to wage distribution, and to the occupational distribution of employment. And in that context, I'll then come back to more specific uh, estimates of what the effects of the rollout of robots in U.S. manufacturing has done. And, and then, based on what we have learned from here, I will come back and talk about the future, in particular, in regards to what it promises for productivity and what it might hold for the future of work. Okay. So what do I mean by enabling and replacing technologies? Essentially, this is a distinction that, of course, is to some degree abstract, and many technologies you might think might fall within uh, both categories, but I'll show you that many technologies that are important can be seen to be much more on the enabling or much more of the replacing sort. By enabling technologies, I mean the technologies that increase the productivity of labor in the tasks that, they, that labor performs. So if you are uh, putting together a particular model of an airplane and you come up with a technology to do that in a better way, that's an enabling technology. A replacing technology, on the other hand, does something quite different. It takes away the tasks by automating it so that humans are no longer necessary for that specific purpose. So therefore, the difference between enabling and replacing is that enabling increases, augments what humans do. Replacing gets rid of the human, at least for most of what is involved in performing a particular specific task in the production process. So let me give you some examples of what I mean by that, first from historical technologies and also then from uh, contemporary technologies. In terms of uh, the first computer, I think People can have very different opinions about what the first computer was, but one argument is that this mechanism that you're seeing there is actually the first computer because it had many of the features of something that you could program in order to uh, increase the, 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 the transmission of knowledge. So this is called the Antikythera mechanism. It goes back to about 200 BC, and it is a, uh, a, a device used by a very small subsection of the uh, ancient Greek society in order to uh, predicting the astronomical positions of, of, uh, of, of stars. So it's a clear enabling uh, technology because what it is doing is that it's enabling these very skilled Greek astronomers to do things that they were not able to do before. In contrast, here is another more computer-like technology that has also been uh, heralded as the uh, grandfather of uh, modern computers. It's, a, uh, it's called the Jacquard's loom. It's a power loom that was introduced by a French engineer and it essentially automates part of the textile production, the weaving part of the textile production uh, process. And it has the first use of the punch cards. This is one of a series of power looms that automated the weaving process and uh, took weavers out of the production process. And it's uh, things actually that are quite similar to the Jacquard's loom were being used until uh, 30, 40 years ago. So these are, of course, ancient technologies, but if you want to uh, 
sort of uh, think of uh, modern times, you can similarly find many examples of enabling and replacing technologies, and of course many examples that will be somewhere between the enabling and the, uh, and the replacing spectrum. So one clear uh, example would be computer-assisted design. So these sorts of machines have increased the ability of design workers to produce very precise designs very quickly in a way that augments their skills and abilities to, a, to an extent that was not possible before these computerized technologies. On the other hand, the archetypal example of a replacing technology today is robotics. So this is a picture of a Hyundai factory and what's uh, remarkable here is that you won't see many workers. There's one there in the background. I don't know what he's doing, but this is a fully automated workplace. So that's the difference between enabling and replacing. The computer assisted design machine is not going to work without somebody designing something. So it is enabling that person to do something more than he or she was able to do before. Whereas here, these robots have replaced workers from the assembly line. And of course, you can put your many applications of AI, which I'm going to talk about later in the talk, within the category of AI. So many of the applications of AI that have not really been uh, introduced yet, but they are in the process of being introduced, where you're going to have AI prepare paralegal documents, uh, financial uh, predictions, tax accounts, decision-making processes are all in the replacing category. And this distinction between replacing and enabling technologies is important because they create very different effects on the labor market. So why as economists, and here I'm not separate from the rest of the economists, for 20 years I've thought just like the rest of the economists uh, that Keynes was wrong and technological change, even if it did bring some disruption, would ultimately lead to both employment and wage growth. Why did we think that? We thought that because our framework for thinking about technologies was very much based on enabling technologies. And enabling technologies imply one very simple uh, point about the effects of technologies on the labor market. When a technology increases productivity, it also increases wages. There is no way for enabling technologies to reduce wages overall. Perhaps, depending on how you think about them, they might reduce the wages of some narrow group of workers or uh, change the organizations in such a way that doesn't benefit everybody. Uh, certainly they could do so to some degree that some people benefit more than others, but overall wage growth is always going to be a consequence of that. And because wage growth is going to increase labor demand, uh, the, the willingness of people to actually work, employment is going to follow the increases in wages also. So enabling technologies thus are of the sort the, uh, that will lift all boats. They will tend to benefit workers, not come at the expense of workers. That is not so for replacing technologies. Because replacing technologies directly take away tasks that were produced previously by workers, they create a first order displacement effect. So previously, there were several workers who manned the assembly lines of the car factories. Now the machines and the robots come, and those workers lose their jobs. That creates a negative effect on employment and a negative effect on wages. Is it the case that display, uh, replacing technologies always have a negative effect on employment? The answer is also no, because in addition to the displacement effect, they create a whole host of positive influences. And in particular, let's think about this in the context of the car factories that I have already used as an example. Imagine that General Motors now introduces robots in order to produce cars on its assembly lines. What does that do? Well, the first order, the first impact of this will be that General Motors is doing that because robots are cheaper. So if robots are cheaper than workers, then the cost of producing cars goes down, and the reduction in the cost of cars means that people will want to, uh, to consume more cars. To the extent that not everything has been automated, there are 
you know, millions of non-production jobs associated with the auto industry in the United States, as well as uh, several hundred thousands of, or tens of thousands of uh, production work still uh, around related to, the, to auto workers. Those, the demand for labor that performs these non-production and production tasks in the auto industry is going to increase because the lower cost of autos is going to mean people are going to want to buy more autos. That's one facet of a productivity effect. But there is more. The reduction in the cost of autos means that we're all richer. If we are richer, we don't just want to consume autos, we want to consume all sorts of other things. In particular, we would want to have better health care, better entertainment, perhaps uh, better widgets for our home. And all of these increased demands will translate into employment effects. So therefore, for replacing technologies as opposed to the enabling technologies, there is this race between the displacement effect and the productivity effect. When will the productivity effect win out? When will it lose out so that the displacement effect is greater and technologies destroy jobs and destroy reduce wages? The first one, the first element here is that if the productivity effect is weak, then we are in trouble. And this is actually a very important point. If you read the popular media, the picture that's painted, and it's an interesting picture, but a picture is, that's painted is one in which we have these brilliant technologies that can perform everything so much better than humans can do, and that's why we're all going to be thrown out of work. But if those technologies are really so great, they would also reduce costs a lot, so they would generate a huge productivity effect. Actually, what we should be scared of are not those brilliant technologies, but the so-so technologies. They replace workers, but they don't reduce your costs all that much. If that's the case, you lose the workers, the displacement effect, but the productivity effect doesn't kick in. The second element that needs to be borne in mind is whether our workforce, and I'm going to come back to this point at the end again, whether our workforce has the skills that are complementary to machines. If we have the skills complementary to machines, then the increase in the demand for labor will be stronger. But if all that we know as workers are to perform form the tasks that computers can perform or robots can perform, but worse, then we're really thrown out of work. So therefore, the two elements that we have to bear in mind in the age of uh, replacing technologies is whether we can combat the displacement effect with enough productivity improvements so brilliant technologies versus so-so technologies, and whether we have the complementary skills. So in this framework, let's now talk a little bit more about robots and computers. So I think there is no well-accepted definition of what are robots and what are computers, but for this talk, I'm going to use robots as like the industrial robots that we saw in the car, uh, uh, in, the, in, in the Hyundai plan is they are automatically controlled, reprogrammable, multi-purpose machines that autonomously interact with the world. The AI is the word that sometimes used to refer to the broad cluster of technologies based on deep learning, uh, an element that Alan already mentioned, that are used for solving and detecting patterns in, uh, in a continuous fashion on unstructured data. And this unstructured data an algorithmic approach to AI is actually quite important because there are some claims in the literature and by some very, very clever people, so they are not to be dismissed, but they are based on the idea that AI is going to be able to do exactly everything that humans do. And in fact, that was the original model of AI. Cybernetics and the artificial intelligence technologies that followed on it in the 1970s originally thought that we could program machines to think exactly like humans. That led to a total failure and probably set back the field of AI by about 20 years. And then the second wave based on neural networks, algorithmic approaches to unstructured data, deep learning and various other applications of huge power of uh, today's computers uh, let, take, took a different approach. There is no attempt to replicate the human mind but there is an attempt to single out tasks and perform those tasks. And generally in the AI domain, those are tasks that are just about information processing. Now the importance of that is that if the world is one in which AI is going to keep on doing this, 
it's not going to totally replace humans because it's not going to replace the human mind. So there is no issue, and in fact, we're going to see that the evidence is not suggesting that either. There is no issue of AI completely replacing humans, but AI is continuously going to take away from the tasks that humans were previously performing. And that's going to lead to a sort of a race between machines and men, which I'm going to talk about. Now, robots were for a long time viewed as things that were just going to be very, very limited in what they could do, because there are a whole host of things that come naturally to humans that are very difficult for machines. But now, uh, this is, for example, Baxter. Uh, it's a robot that's uh, very good at folding shirts. So that's one of the tasks that people thought was going to be very difficult for robots to perform 10 years ago. Now it's fairly routine. Typical applications of AI that we have seen already quite important improvements are things like financial planning, tax preparation, but there are also more creative applications. For instance, uh, recent work by uh, several academics at Cornell and Harvard shows that if you use AI techniques in order to uh, perform bail decisions, they're going to do about 25% better than judges in, uh, in keeping the same amount of uh, people locked up for bail but reducing the crime rate by 25% because judges are just not processing the information and are making the wrong decisions. So that's just like a snippet of the types of things that AI is going to be able to do. So let me now come to the US data. So I already sort of anticipated some of this by saying there are really big changes. And here are two of those. The dotted line there is the labor share in employment, and the dark line is the employment rate of prime age men. So if you go back 35 years, you would see that almost 90%, 95, sorry, almost 95 percent of prime age men would be working. To that, today, that number is just above 80. So the employment rate of men is declining, and that is not unrelated to the fact that the work that they are doing is being less and less compensated. And you can see that with the red dotted line where the share of labor income in national income stood around 66% about 35 years ago, and now it's just about 56%. Now this is the aggregate picture. But perhaps more interesting is what's going on to the level of wages and also to the distribution of wages. So, and again, the first way that the economists thought about this issue was using this sort of enabling technologies. But one strong implication of the enabling technologies, as I pointed out, is that you should not have these productivity improvements associated with real wage declines. So here what I'm showing you is the US wage picture, and you are seeing the high school dropouts, the blue, workers with high school degree, which are the red, green, some college, workers with college degree, yellow, and those with greater than college postgraduate degrees, the light blue. Now look at the beginning of the picture. That's starting in 1963, but you can go a little bit further back using other data. The pattern is the same until about 1974. That's the period of rapid wage growth and wage growth of all five groups more or less parallel. That's the period of the rising technological tide lifting all boats. So if you were living through that, and some people here were, uh, you would be in the middle of a buoyant labor market and a view based on enabling technologies would just fit like a glove. But then the picture changes. Over the last 35 years, we are seeing first slower wage growth. The, the rate at which these curves are all increasing, even the top one, is slower than what was going on in the 1960s and the early 70s. Second, you are seeing this fanning out of these pictures, much greater increase in inequality, constant steady increase in inequality between, say, workers with college degree and those without, or workers with postgraduate degrees and those without. But most importantly for this debate between enabling and replacing technologies, you also see that the three bottom groups, high school graduates, high school dropouts, and uh, those with some college, are experiencing quite significant real wage declines over this period, something that, again, the enabling technologies framework says it shouldn't happen. So this is a telltale sign that something that's out of the ordinary from the sort of the simplest textbook model that you can imagine. In fact, 
even more troubling perhaps to some people is that if you look at the yellow line, yellow curve, the college graduates are not doing that well. They did not experience the initial decline in the wages that high school graduates, for example, did, but then they had a fairly anemic growth and the gap between postgraduates and the college graduates is increasing steadily over the last 15 years. Now, these are different education groups. Perhaps the composition of who is a college graduate and who is a, college, uh, who is a high school graduate is changing. So here is the picture when you just look at the overall wage distribution. So here the green line is the 90th percentile of the wage distribution, the red line is the median of the wage, and the blue line is the bottom 10%. So you see fairly anemic growth of wages at the median, so US workers are not scoring wage growth during this period, even though productivity is growing, even though the US is becoming very rich, even though we are seeing these brilliant, mind-boggling technologies. But even more concerning, in some sense, to relative to what we are used to, the middle is doing even worse than the bottom. Look at the blue curve from the 1990 onwards. It grows more than the red curve. So the middle is the one that's most anemic. And that is underscored by this picture also. So what this picture does is that on the horizontal axis, it ranks different occupations by their skill requirements or level of wages. This, the two actually turn out to be very similar. Here I think it's the level of wages, but if you do it by skill level, it's the same also. And then on the vertical axis, it shows how much employment changed in the indicated occupation for the relevant decade. In particular, the uh, red curve is for the 1980s, the blue curve is for the 1990s, and the red curve, the gray, gray curve is for the 2000s. So the 1980s is exactly the pattern that you would expect. This is the period in which the skilled occupations, managers, uh, <coughs> supervisors, engineers, economists, they're all experiencing not just wage growth, but they're also experiencing employment growth. Employers want to hire more managers. They want a few more production workers, which are in the middle of the occupations. They don't want any of these occupations that are very, very low in the, in the scale, like protection services, uh, like cleaning staff, and so on and so forth. It's the more skilled occupations for which there is the demand is increasing. But the picture changes radically in the 2000s, which is the blue curve. In the blue curve, instead of this increasing pattern which says more employment growth in the more skilled occupations, you have the U, shape, inverse, the, the U shape, which says that you have more employment growth at the bottom and more employment growth at the top. The middle is where you see negative employment growth. So this is the period where we are seeing many of these production jobs, the assembly line work, uh, disappearing. because Some of it because of globalization, but a lot of it because of technology. But to compensate for that, there is much faster growth of the jobs at the two ends. Skilled occupations are still growing, but the bottom is also growing. What are those bottom occupations? Those are the cleaning services, low-skill low health care, protection, uh, other menial tasks. Part of this is that people who are losing their jobs in the middle go and de-skill, they take lower skill, lower ranked occupations. But the picture becomes even more striking when you look at the gray one, the 2000s. Now, in the 2000s, you have just growth at the bottom. You don't have any growth in the high skill occupations, you don't have any growth in the middle, but just at the bottom. So we're just producing relatively low skill jobs, the jobs in the lowest pay, lowest skill occupations. So this is an alarming picture because it says that from the age where technology was complementing and creating jobs for engineers and production workers, the 1980s, and if you go back earlier, 70s would be the same also, you are transitioning to a period in which first the middle, then perhaps later the top is, has ceased to expand. And this is not just a US phenomenon. Here is data from the OECD, so you can read the names of the different countries. And what this picture does is that it shows you changes in the employment of different types of occupations. In particular, the green is the highest paid occupations, the blue is the lowest paid occupation, and the red is the one-third of the middle occupations. 
from the beginning of the 1990s to the mid-2000s. And what you see is that in every country that you have here, for which we have data, the middle is shrinking. There are less and less jobs of the production worker and clerical type, which were the breadwinners for many families, men, for men and women. Is this the effect of technology? Well, there are many things going on. As I mentioned, there is globalization. There are institutional changes. We have a total cultural and uh, life changes that have been engulfing the United States and other countries throughout this period. So we need to look at more carefully at what's going on to specific technologies. And here, I'm going to just give you a little bit of a feel for that by looking at the spread of industrial robots. So what I have done here is I have taken data on which industries are adopting robots and then by looking at the uh, uh, local distribution of employment determined which sorts of local areas, say Flint, Michigan versus uh, Wisconsin or Greater Boston versus Lowell and Lawrence, which are the areas that are mo at, more, at greater risk of robots replacing workers. The darker colors mean those are the places that are more exposed to robots. And you see where the exposure to robots is greatest. It's the greatest in the industrial heartland of the United States, the Rust Belt, to some degree going way all the way down to on the, on the East Coast Corridor. On the, on the, on the right-hand side, I have shown the same uh, U.S. map, but now with imports from China. Because whenever you talk about technology, one alternative explanation that people come up with, what about outsourcing? What about offshoring? What about uh, textile jobs or other jobs going to China and being back, imported back into the United States? Yes, indeed, there's a lot of that going on also. It's also interesting that the correlation between these two things, imports from China and robots, is actually quite weak. That correlation, if you don't put anything else, the spatial correlation would be 0.05, very, very low level of correlation. And that reflects the fact that robots uh, influence place things like the auto manufacturers, chemical, electronics, metal products, whether China imports, we're talking of simple assembly jobs, apparel, furniture, toys, and textile. It's very different industries, and their geographic distribution is also very different. So then let's look at what's happened during this period in which robots penetrated the US economy. What's happened to the employment level of places that were more exposed to robots? Again, in a world of enabling technologies, we should see these places thrive both productivity-wise but also in terms of employment and wages. And this picture here shows that the effect is actually not very positive at all. Places that have been more exposed to robots have had significant shrinkage in their employment. So the extreme point there is Flint, Michigan. That's the one that's most exposed, for example. But you'll see that many other places are very exposed also and have experienced rather rapid rollout of industrial robots and their employment hasn't done very well. Same thing when you look at wages. Wage levels have been not just stagnant, but actually declining in the areas that are most uh, at, on the firing line of robots. So therefore, I take this evidence as suggestive that just as in the discussion that I provided at the beginning of replacing technologies, we are in the midst of a process where we have a array of different replacing technologies. Industrial robots is just one example, but the oncoming AI revolution is an even bigger, bigger one. And if indeed, as appears to have been the case, if these technologies are not creating a productivity revolution, and I'll talk a little bit about that in a second, and we don't really have the complementary skills, the displacement effect is going to win out, and we should experience lower wages and lower employment, and that's what we are seeing. But it also should be added immediately that the numbers here are not apocalyptic. We're not talking of millions of people losing jobs. So if you take the numbers that I'm showing you here, it would imply that robots reduced US employment by one third of a percentage point. So not trivial, but nothing relative to the huge decline in employment in manufacturing, for example, which is more than three percentage points. So uh, during the same period. So we're not talking about the end of job, but we are talking 
powerful technologies that may be pushing us in the direction that we have to uh, deal with these. Now, if this is the case, where will jobs come from? Well, there are two scenarios, there are two views, and I want to talk about both of these views. And these views relate to what I just talked about, the complementarity issue. One view is the optimistic scenario, which starts by noting that automation is not a new phenomenon. We've been automating, we've been experiencing new technologies throughout the ages. But we, as automation goes on, we create complementary tasks. We find new ways in which humans are useful. We create new things. When the railroads come and uh, replace the uh, horse-drawn carriages, we create a whole host of new occupations associated with the railroad, engineers, conductors, maintenance workers, financiers, and managers. In the same way that when computers come, uh, came, we created a whole host of ra uh, computerized radiology computer engineers, software developers, uh, and, and very different versions of many of the tasks that were manual in advance. So if in this figure, what you see is that if you look at the past, the last the, the three decades up to 2007 in the United States, a lot of the work, about half of the employment growth in the US comes from the creation of new tasks. On the horizontal axis, you have how much of new tasks there are, are embedded in a new occupation, and you see that occupations that have more new tasks are growing more rapidly. So this is where the lever that I talked about, which is creating complementary skills for technologies, is important because one way in which we can do that is by creating new tasks that are going to generate high-wage employment opportunities. But there is the pessimistic view, which is not crazy either because that's very much informed from the 2000s. As you saw in the 2000s, we did not create, as the industrial robots were coming on and automation was uh, progressing very rapidly, we did not create many new tasks that were high paying. Instead, we created a lot more of these workers who are in food preparation, cleaning, protection services, and low skill health healthcare. Perhaps the future is going to be one in which robots and AI are going to take all of the high skill jobs and uh, and then we're going to be left with, the, with these jobs for a very large fraction of the US population. That's a question about predicting the future, but it's also a question about policy, because I think the line that demar demarcates these two scenarios is not a given one. It's one that depends on what sorts of skills our workforce has. If our workforce has no skills that can be in great demand in high wage jobs, of course they will have to go and work in protection services on food preparation. But with a differently skilled workforce, the scenario could be very different. But a lot of this then comes down to how much productivity we are generating from these new technologies. As I've already noted several times, if you are in the world of display, replacing technologies, you need to fight the displacement effect to some degree with the complementary skills, but to a great degree with these productivity effects. Do we have those productivity effects? And here, the picture in the popular press and the discussions that you may have followed on the web is even more confusing. Because on the one hand, there are economists and, uh, and engineers and uh, AI scientists who are uh, <clears throat> predicting the arrival of infinite wealth because our machines are becoming so and so uh, are becoming so productive, and for example, uh, Kurzweil's singularity thesis and many other computer scientists and AI specialists are predicting machines that can produce machines and can do everything so efficiently that we can have the age of plenty. On the other hand, uh, we uh, have people such as Robert Gordon, who uh, created an unlikely bestseller last year with a book that heralded the arrival of low productivity growth uh, in the next several decades. So which one is the case? Well, let's first of all look at the data. The data actually is more firmly on Robert Gordon's side, at least at first sight. Here is the productivity growth, multi-factor productivity growth, how much we are increasing our ability to produce things for when you control for labor and capital. And that productivity growth was indeed very rapid in the 30s, 40s, up all the way up to the 70s. And then look at what's going on in the age of the AI, computers, and robotics. It's been much slower. Now, 
people will say, well, we're not measuring productivity and so on and so forth, and, and correctly, and there is some truth to that, but a lot of the problems with measurement apply to the 50s and the 60s and the 70s also. So that's not a complete explanation. So I think what's going on is that we are reliving what Bob Solo, my uh, colleague at MIT and uh, one of the founders of growth economics, anticipated in 1987 in a New York Review of Books. He said, we can see the computer age everywhere, but in the productivity statistics. And at the time, everybody said, this is a temporary phenomenon. It's going to be another 10 years. And now it's been, 35, it's been uh, 30 years since Bob Solo wrote that. And we still don't see it as the previous picture shows. So what is going on? The optimistic view is that still this is temporary and we are making it much, much worse because we are not counting Wikipedia. We're not counting all the services that Google provides. And once you count them, productivity is not so bad and it's going to improve. But I think a much more relevant perspective, or at least the one that I would subscribe, is related to the issue of the complementary skills that I have already highlighted, which is that we are facing many bottlenecks. New technologies, robotics, AI, require complementary skills, require other technological improvements so that they can work very well. They can require organizational changes. So imagine your car, for example. In so many ways, it's superior to the cars that you were driving 30 years ago. But at the end of the day, you can drive it no faster, and uh, it cannot get you from A to B any faster. In fact, it will get you from A to B much slower than you did 30 years ago, because traffic regulations haven't changed, roads are very congested, and there are actually parts of the car that have not kept up with those improvements, such as tires or other safety, uh, uh, safety technologies that wouldn't really stand you driving at 120 miles an hour. So all of those widgets that have improved the internal combustion engine and added to the car, they're not useful because there are other bottlenecks. And if you look at history, History really emphasizes the importance of such bottlenecks. And I will just conclude with this brief discussion of what the economic historian Bob Allen has called Engels' pose. Because if you want to compare our age of wonderful, brilliant, mind-boggling technologies that are coming from every corner to another one, I think there is no better candidate than the age of the Industrial Revolution. Starting from 1760 in Britain and then later in other parts of Western Europe, you've had these waves of technologies that people could not even imagine and started a process of changing, automating, improving production processes all around in the economy and changing people's lives. But what happened? Well, productivity growth was actually pretty slow. And for 90 years, there was no wage growth. And Bob Allen calls this Engels pose. This is what Frederick Engel was motivated by saying, there's not going to be any wage growth. It lasted for 90 years. How come these wonderful technologies were changing things so radically and we are not seeing any wage growth? Well, we can look at one specific technology and one specific occupation, weavers. Well, what happened with weavers? Well, one thing what happened is that when the first power looms were introduced, they did increase productivity by several fold. But at the same time, they also displaced uh, weavers from certain tasks. And they were not adopted in a way that was broad within the whole economy. So some companies made the switch to the power loom, some others didn't, and the demand for weavers did not really increase. It took another 50 years for the power loom to spread and go through several more iterations so that productivity now increased by 20-fold. And it was only at that point that the demand for textile workers increased quite strongly and you start seeing some wage growth. So it really was the culmination of the technological changes that led to the whole industry changing and many complementary technologies and organizational improvements being made at the same time. But I think even this understates the complexity of the task of dealing with the arrival of new technologies. Because while this was happening, the power loom was spreading and was becoming more productive in the weaving industry, the, there were many, many more, more consequential changes taking place in the British society. For example, starting in 18, 1832, Britain became a democracy or started first steps towards democracy and ultimately extending the suffrage more and more to universal suffrage, both to men and women in the course of about 80 years. 
In the, the, in the, the, the two decades following 1832, universal education started being introduced. You, labor unions started negotiating wages uh, in a way that started protecting workers. So therefore, there was a whole slew of institutional changes that were adapted and started being adapted to the technological revolutions that the British society was experiencing at the end of the 18th and the beginning of the 19th century. So if looked at it that way, we are very much at the beginning of it, and we are at the very much at the beginning of it without really having a map about how the future should look like, and I think that's the most important lesson that I want to underscore in closing these remarks. I think we are really very much in the middle of some very transformative changes. And the way to deal with these changes is to understand them better, to make knowledge-based, quantitatively sound assessments about what they are doing and what they are likely to do, and change our own investments, our own policy positions, and our own institutions in a way that's coherent with this picture. Thank you very much. <laughs>